Well, on our distinguished panel uh, this morning, we have, uh, we have uh, a wide range of experience. I would only be exaggerating a little bit if I said about a thousand years of experience between everybody up here. Okay, maybe a, maybe a century's worth of experience. We have uh, Martin Davidson, partner in Diamond Schmidt, uh, graduate of the School of Architecture, University of British Columbia. He's currently the lead project architect for the rehabilitation of the prestigious government conference center in Ottawa, poised to become the temporary home of the Senate during the uh, restoration of the center block of the parliament. So we've got Martin Davidson. We have Mr. Glenn Pestron from York Marble. Uh, for the past 17 years, he's a second generation stone fabricator with a bachelor's degree in economics, and he's also served as director of the TTMAC and been a proud uh, member of that for over 25 years, Glenn Pestron from New York Marble. And we also have Mike Pico, Pico Engineering, president CEO of Pico Engineering, professional engineer with over 30 years' experience, certainly well known in, uh, in the stone industry in Canada, United States for his uh, engineering services. This is your, uh, your panel this morning. We've put together a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation that we're going to run through first. There's a microphone that we'll have some available for questions and answers afterwards. Um, before we start the PowerPoint, you know, stone is certainly something that's been in my family for, for many, many generations. And uh, I, wish we could have, I wish we could have taped the, the – we had a sit-down presentation uh, a week ago at Martin's office to talk about the things we were going to talk about today. And it really would have been fun for you guys if we taped that presentation. You know, we sat together for what about, I guess, almost two hours, the four of us, talking about all kinds of different things and what we're going to talk about here today. And I think the underlying factor for a lot of what we talked about was communication, making sure that you guys get the information you need, uh, you understand what you're getting, and, uh, and having, you know, success. So I'm going to turn it over to Martin, and you can, uh, you can begin the presentation. Certainly enjoy it. We thought we'd, uh, I guess, a couple things just by way of background. I know the conference has a, a fairly wide range um, of, of topics and uh, materials, but we're going to focus today principally on stone, though some of the applications that we're talking about uh, translate into, into tile and large format panels as well. Um, I think one of the first things, as we were all talking about this last week, was uh, really an understanding that we, we say stone's a natural material, but we don't uh, often accept all the things that comes with it, which has to do with variability and a lot of technical characteristics that, are, uh, that change uh, quite frequently. So I think a lot of what we're going to talk about, and certainly the challenges that, that um, Mike and Glenn uh, face uh, with getting the specs from people like us, is how to actually make it work. And uh, as we, we go through things today, we're going to talk a little bit about some of uh, the recent innovations, but there's also an incredible industry uh, that's been around for hundreds of years, as you know, and, and those are modernizing and taking uh, really a lot of... Uh, the research and, and uh, improvements in this industry forward. So I, I think we really need to acknowledge that uh, while there's an interest in what's coming in the next five or ten years, there's also an amazing history to draw upon in, in this industry. Uh, we thought we'd, we'd start by talking about resins, which seems like an odd thing to, uh, to talk about, but when we, we talk about some of the things that have happened over the last uh, decade or two, Resins has been a remarkable, uh, has had a remarkable impact, I think, on, on the industry. Certainly what it's allowed uh, to happen is uh, the quarrying and fabrication of stones and, uh, that have never been possible before. So I think what we've, we've seen is that, that historically uh, a quarry might yield 20 or 30 percent of its stone into, into block material that, that eventually becomes slab and, and tile. Um, with the ability to use resins, they've been able to consolidate parts of the mountain and, and slabs as well to quarry products that have never been available before. And I think, Glenn, you've had uh, 
some experience with, with how this has expanded the, the industry. Uh, resins have been in our industry for probably the last 20 or 30 years. You typically use them for edge detailing to glue pieces together. Um, resins now being used to reinforce blocks, reinforce slabs, have come to a level uh, like no other. As mentioned before, core yields have gone or doubled up uh, in the past five to six years. The challenge with the resins is being able to work with them after the product has been processed. So we have to be careful on setting systems when it comes to the flooring. Uh, we have to be careful uh, on our wall installations. It's given us the ability to work with basically precious stones, very costly stones that we were never able to do before. So what does this mean to the architects and designers in the room? Um, know your products, know what kind of resining was done, and know the limitations of the product before you select it. Um, we've seen onyx come onto line probably the last six or seven years. People want to put onyx everywhere. We can't put onyx everywhere. We're able to uh, use onyx in bigger and better slabs, yet we still have limitations on how we're going to set it on the floor and, and how we're going to handle the product. So although it has let the blocks be usable, it's not made them foolproof uh, like some of the sister products, marble, and, marble, granite, or engineered quartz. Thanks. And, and I think that uh, this is what we found with many of these things, that as these products have come online, the technologies often lag behind. This is a, a, just a slide to show you what that looks like. You can see a, a block that was cut out of a quarry and then uh, consolidated with resin before it ever left the mountain. And this never would have been possible before, and it's, it's just led to a, a huge amount of new products being available. And in this slide, you can just see this is obviously uh, going to get cut out, but you can just see what, how that resin imp really uh, impregnates into the deep fissures of stones and is able to consolidate it in a way that was never possible. And that's yielded, as, as Bill said, some of these amazing exotic stones. And the range is, is really remarkable now. Uh, these are stones that, that just weren't 20 years ago never available. No one saw these. And these are happening all over the world. And where you know, a generation ago, you'd see a lot of Carrera marble and travertines and, and Brazilian granites. Now, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of stones from, from all over the world. And, and it's also led to the creation of manufactured stones. Um, in this case, uh, Bill, you were mentioning kind of the, the sort of exotics that, that occur. This is a case of using uh, geodes, putting them together, then sawing them and making you know, really large scale panels, five by 10 feet of, of these. And they can be quite translucent and used in all kinds of, of specialty ways. And this is probably one extreme of that. Uh, this is a case of, of petrified wood, again, uh, being laid up in ways that were just not imaginable. So there's this incredible diversity of materials now to compete with uh, a lot of what we see in, in large format tile or, or uh, even in the wood industry. The other thing that's changed hugely, I think, has been the development of CNC uh, equipment and, and the software that goes, that goes with it. Uh, this is a, a case, this was um, being done for, uh, I, I think, uh, a, a home in the Middle East. Uh, and you can see the level of uh, specificity in the water jet cutting and, and laser cutting of these kinds of products that allow for inlays in ways that were done, at one time they were done by hand uh, in incredibly labor intensive ways and now their uh, computer file uh, ends up uh, doing this, getting all the pieces and someone is just really assembling them. No, definitely a big change. So before, uh, as we used to say, a marmista, our marble master was an older guy who hunched over, had marble dust in his hair, was always white. Now our marble masters are 25 and 26 years old sitting in front of computers. So it's, it's a transition that we are going with, uh, some of us reluctantly. But the idea, to, you still need to marry the craftsmanship with the technology and going back again to knowing the limits of the stone and, and what you want to do with it. Our challenge is being able to educate and open up 
possibilities to architects and designers. It's no more, we don't need rectangles anymore. We don't need squares. Uh, equipment now has gone into four, five, and six access, fully robotic machines. So it's limitless what we can do with stone. You'll see some examples of that. So let yourselves dream, think of the impossible, and we can probably do it. Uh, certainly also uh, coloring has become uh, something that's emerging in Italy quite a lot, and I think elsewhere in the world where the same people that make these um, resins are generating uh, resins that are colored and, and they're able to um, take granite and turn it into all, all kinds of colors. They're able to use quartzites in ways that, that weren't done before. And certainly in finishing, um, you know, traditionally we saw honing and polishing as the, the two main kinds of uh, finishes. Now the level of textures is quite remarkable and you, you get it in um, I think in, in the water jet cuts and the kind of brush finishes, and they haven't, I, I don't think, uh, and, and you might both know, but they, I don't think they've really landed in Canada to the same degree as, as you see overseas of some of the, the very deep textured finishes that take stones that uh, at one time you would only use for, for gravel, and, and now they're being, being uh, uh, textured in ways that make them really fascinating and are being used both in interior and exterior applications. No, it's very true. Texturing is um, is new to us. I'd probably say the last, uh, Mike, what do you think, seven, eight years? Something like that. Um, and then, of course, that texturing can vary. So what we get here is a sampling of what's possible. Um, stone very much like fashion uh, follows Europe. So Europe will be the first to try it. New colors, new textures, new patterns. If it takes over there, architects and designers slowly embrace it, and then those products and offering come, come over to Canada. So don't be afraid to ask. Uh, and, and then really one of the, the other things that Mike uh, or Glenn mentioned right at the beginning is the use of onyx. Well, this is a, a, a picture of the uh, Mariinsky Opera in St. Petersburg that our office did where... Uh, Behind this um, kind of traditionally laid stone facade, uh, we used onyx in the lobby as a, a translucent material. This is just something that I think wasn't uh, possible that long ago. And uh, the fabrication and, and installation and the techniques for hanging this and illuminating it um, and working through the details of it is really a kind of emerging uh, innovation, uh, but it but it yields kind of just these remarkable results, really, and and these are coming from uh, uh, Turkey, Iran, really all over the world, and often uh, being fabricated in Italy or, or elsewhere in the world. I think, and I think you've had some experience with some of these products. Uh, I've had some experience with the products, and working with these products, you really need a, a three-way marriage between the architect, the engineer, and, and the fabricator. Without having that um, synergy between us, to achieve projects like this is very, very difficult. And Mike can probably speak to uh, your project, the Museum of uh, Human Rights, that's coming up. Yeah. yeah. And Michael, yeah tell you a little bit more about that and the coordination that it took to, to get that job done. I think we're keeping Mike quiet for a minute because he's our secret weapon. But, but uh, um, really, I think one of the lessons that we've learned as an architectural firm is, is that the, uh, the kind of level of collaboration that's required to execute some of these projects now is so critical because we can't hold all the knowledge ourselves, and there's uh, the suspension systems, the, the hanging systems, certainly the engineering for environmental conditions has become hugely more complicated, both uh, as, as building science evolves and as envelope technology evolves. And so these things, getting these things hung in ways where you don't see the fastening, you're able to suspend them without getting shadows behind them, is really incredibly reliant on the kind of synergy between the engineers you're working with and uh, and, and your design. And, and we've been fortunate in, in uh, working with Mike and other engineers in, in order to do this kind of uh, 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 projects, really. Uh, and that really leads us to this, this discussion of, I think, something that 
uh, we call design assist. I think you're familiar with it in, in many other fields of, of uh, practice. Uh, and we wanted to really talk to you about that because I think it's something that we see happening a lot uh, in projects in Europe. We do it when we work with European fabricators. It's not an uncommon thing, but it's something that has really been, I think, slow to come to the Canadian market. And, and I would argue that it's one of the um, that, that this design assist is something that brings together um, uh, architects with designers and fabricators and installers in a way that has advantages to the client and to the project that are really um, quite remarkable and have no real uh, serious impacts on, on costs. Um, and we're going to take you through, through some of this uh, in looking at... Um, uh, just some of the advantages to it. Now, for us as architects, it means that we don't have to go to a showroom here in Toronto and have the choice between whether we want a 12 by 12 tile or a 12 by 24 tile, and, and, and that's it. We can really, um, the whole idea of the cut to size program that's very prevalent in Europe and elsewhere allows you to customize any of the sizes at virtually uh, you know, no premium. And it also allows for the introduction of figuring out all the problems that inevitably happen early on before it begins. And this is really uh, a result of the collaboration. And I'm going to let, I think, both Mike and uh, Glenn speak to this for, for a couple minutes because they've had also some very direct experience with this. So, do you want me to go first, Mike? Or you? Okay. Uh, you're good? Um, the challenge is managing information and options. So 40 years ago, there was approximately 20 to 30 marketable stones that architects and designers could use. 30 years ago, there was probably 100. 20 years ago, we were probably up to 200, 250. Now we're up to over 520 marketable materials that can be used in a building. To compound that information glut, we have setting materials. Um, 25 years ago, there was one setting product, LNM. Now we have, and this is for each product line, having Laticrete, Mape, um, Custom, probably another 10 other ones. Each one probably has another 30 uh, products that they can be used to install stone. And then engineering systems, and I'll let Mike speak to that, there's countless. Uh, methods in which we can install it. So now, how do we manage this entire system and give the architect, designer, and the owner what they want? The best vehicle, as mentioned by Martin, is design assist. So at this point, we're brought together as a group, the three of us, and we're given a budget and a goal to design and complete this building. And having the freedom to collaborate amongst ourselves brings the best ideas to the table, the best methods to the table. Always paying attention to the budget, of course, because without a budget, you know, we, we would run rampant. Having that ability to openly talk and discuss and explore leads to great products at the end. It leads to uh, not divided camps, but a synergy to a goal, because as a fabricator uh, and specifier, I'm going to stand behind the products I recommend and how we're going to do it. Mike is going to be working with me and find the best way in, to install it, and myself working with Martin, we're going to find the best patterns in which to reduce waste and to enhance the, the design uh, of, of the building. So I don't know what you want to add to that, Mike. Um, yeah, part of the design assist process is the visual aspects, which uh, you've spoken to in some of these samples of dry laying, to understand the variability in the stone, the different colors. But as Glenn mentioned, the, the availability of products and setting materials out there, whether it's an, an adhered system or a mechanically anchored system, I mean, the, the, the options are limitless out there. So there's good ways to do it and there's bad ways to do it. And you need to explore all the options and try and come up with most efficient way to do it, something that uh, obviously meets the architect's design intent, which is what we want to deliver to the owner. We want to deliver the best product uh, aesthetically, but also technically, and making sure that it's going to perform and do the job that it needs to do. 
And the design assist process just gives you the tools to vet out all the options and come up with that best solution. So the collaboration between the architect's vision, the installer and fabricator, and from a technical uh, perspective, we can all brainstorm together and understand where the limitations and benefits are of e each of the areas. So we've, we've been involved in some really, really complicated projects that have gone through this design assist process. And the end results have always been highly successful. So uh, I really encourage uh, you know, architects and designers, owners, whoever's uh, present, to really embrace that option up front and uh, you'll find that the results are well worth the upfront cost of, of uh, having that program in place. The cost will usually uh, work itself out in the benefits and the efficiencies that you build into the system later. And, it's, and if I can add, it's not just for the big commercial buildings. It is for residential buildings. It is for smaller commercial buildings. It is for institutional work. So it's a tool that can be applied to all levels. I, I wanted to. Uh, Sorry. No, no, but I, I was going to say this, the same thing. Effectively, I think that where where it it's come into the industry in Canada first was on really large institutional projects and complicated projects, and I think that's where where Mike and and we have often kind of found that that it's been used where you're trying to do something that's stretching the traditional or the conventional boundaries of of span or suspension. Or, or fabrication techniques, and, and you can't really rely on just our knowledge as architects to do it. You really need to engage fabricators that have been installing this for, for years or decades and, and engineers who can, can work that out. But it's, it's also really true that it, it has an incredible advantage at the residential scale, too. And it doesn't, I would argue, that it actually doesn't add costs that the, that the that in, in one level it gives uh, someone like, like Glenn certainty about what he's got to work to. So he's, he's got to fix his costs early on and you don't end up with the change orders all the way through the job. You sort of sort those things out earlier and from a client's perspective they get the custom sort of somewhat bespoke design right at the, the front end and it locks all of that in. So uh, and, and certainly more and more uh, what has been programs available in Europe for a long time and I think partly because of global economies uh, obviously countries like Italy and, and others in Europe have not been as strong economically in some recent years they're kind of starting to come over here at the same time a lot of the uh, companies that you deal with the, the, the retailers and the um, the fabrication companies are starting to form these partnerships with companies elsewhere in the world to make this program you know, pretty easily available. And we wanted to take you through a project that, that uh, Glenn and our office were involved in uh, to show you how this works. And this was the, um, the new Globe and Mail building at 351 King, which is just nearing completion now. And this was uh, a, a case of... Uh, a particular stone that we we used. It was actually a stone we used many years earlier in New York at the uh, um, JCC in, in uh, the Upper West Side, uh, uh, Piacentina floor. And, and at that time, which is about 15 years ago that this was done, uh, we were able to do something very similar in the U.S., though it was a lot more uh, uncommon here in, in Toronto. And this was the early rendering of the lobby of the Globe and Mail project. Um, and it's just interesting to see in the context of what we'll show you uh, at the end. Uh, so what happened was uh, a member of our office and, and uh, from York Marble as well, who were the uh, suppliers and installers for this project, uh, the client uh, went to Italy. And it really started with a visit to the quarry. And it's pretty interesting because the first thing you realize is that you're not dealing with blocks. And so if we drew something eight feet long, it just wasn't going to happen. And, and I think that's, you know, one of the first things you learn when you see something like this. The Piazzantina is not quarried out of, uh, out of uh, uh, conventional blocks from a mountain, but comes in these these giant boulders, and it has an incredible variation to it when you, um, when you cut it up. Um, it, it's got a, uh, an enormous iron content, so while it's a very 
beautiful stone. You can get the, as a natural stone, the range of uh, occlusions and iron deposits varies hugely from it. And so the, the whole notion of buying this stone off a skid in a showroom will only lead to disaster. Uh, there's no really other way to, to describe it, I think. And um, Glenn, maybe you want to take us through some of this. This was an early dry laid uh, example. Piazzantina, it's a beautiful stone. It's from northern Italy. It's, it's very hard. Um, but working with the architects and having them come to the quarry and understanding the stone, then they grow to have an appreciation of the stone and understand its limits. And once you have that education in place and that awareness, it's very, very easy to collaborate and to come together. So we know that it had to have some rust inclusions. We knew that we were going to have shading problems. We also knew that our piece size were challenging. So at one point in time, the quarry wasn't yielding the blocks that we needed to. And as a group, we decided that from going to go from uh, three centimeter stone to two centimeter stone in order to increase the yield. Now, if Martin and his team never experienced that, never understood the challenges that we were facing, we would have never been able to do that. We would have had some fist pounding and saying, damn it, I, I wanted three CM, not that architects are demanding at all, but you know, they would have said, I want three CM, I'm gonna get three CM, and instead, we work together as a team to have an, uh, an absolutely beautiful product. And Piazzantina is a very difficult stone to work with. In fact, this stone ended up coming from four quarries, I believe, to get the yield that we needed for this one project. Um, and initially, it gets laid up like this as a, as a dry lay, and then uh, everyone on the team starts looking at it for, for different, um, different reasons, and you start selecting it out. So this is not really setting the actual pattern yet, but just looking at the range of materials that's coming out of the stone. And, um, and then we also found that some of the material was, was really suitable in a flame finish, but not in a honed finish or a polished finish. Again, because the honing and polishing brings out uh, things that aren't seen as, as much in the, in the flame finish. And I have to say, as a fabricator and supplier, we always give the architects the pens that have very, very little ink left in them. So when they start this whole process, they start to get tired because they have to work the pen a bit more. And if that doesn't work, usually we start with a few bottles of white wine first. So, And then we go back to the quarry after they all leave and finish the job, I think. Um, but, but this is what it ends up with. It, it really ends up at a point where... Uh, you, you really eliminate the parts of the, of the stone that you don't want. Um, and, and then you sign off on it, just like you sign off on a shop drawing or anything else. So it, it has a very sort of formal process to it in a way. And you do start to uh, establish the visual range. And, and so f it's, it's not unlike wood in a way. We were talking about how we're very used to doing this in wood. We will specify wood and we'll say it's quarter sawn or it's rift cut or it's flat sawn, and we know what to expect and we know that range. Well, well, stone, you say Piazzantina, it could mean anything. You say uh, the one that, that uh, people like is Carrera marble or Calicata, which, you, you know, the range of that can go from pure white to incredibly brown veined stone. Um, and so it really relies on an understanding of what you're, you're getting from this. And... Um, uh, this gets signed off on. And then the next step is that when it gets cut, uh, sometimes this happens overseas and sometimes it'll happen in, in a place like Glenn's shop where the, the stones, once they arrive, are actually dry laid. And so you, you set the pattern before you glue anything down. So eventually, this is uh, just a shot taken a couple weeks ago uh, of the installation. And you know, I think you can see that it's a fairly, the range is way more even than what you saw in that, that dry laid uh, assembly. So I think this is all a, a story about how uh, the, both cut to size, the, the nature of the collaboration yields incredible advantages to a project and its design intention. What also happens is you eliminate the surprise effect. You know, everybody loves a good surprise, everybody hates a bad surprise. 
So, you know, getting a toaster for Christmas, uh, bad surprise. When we start, and it's like Christmas, the minute the stone arrives at the job site, everybody wants to be there. Owners want to be there. The architect want to be there. And when the stone starts coming out, and all of a sudden people's faces and eyes, I didn't buy that. That doesn't look like that six by six sample. Quick, call the supplier, call everybody, you know, and, and the world is, is set on fire. Now, three things have happened. Number one, expectations weren't communicated properly. Number two, any time that we had to adjust expectation or product is vanished because we're a finishing trade. The schedule is usually compressed by the time we get there, so there's no chance to change or uh, reorientate material. And the third thing is everybody becomes defensive. It's not my fault. The supplier gave me this. No, it's, it's, the, it's the guy from the quarry. No, 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 it's the fabricator. No, no. This way, when the stone is dry laid, we see it, we know it, there's no surprises. What you see at the quarry or in our shop or at the fabricators in Europe is what you're going to get. And that's done six, sometimes eight months in advance. So if anything ever happens on the job, we have a chance to, to change our course and to accommodate. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is, is um, panelization and assemblies. And I think, Mike, this is where you're going to have to wake up again now, because this is, you're, you're going to be on here. Um, certainly one of the, the, the other aspects of the industry that's changed hugely is um, it, it coming, technology is coming from a couple different directions, and, and one of them, uh, and, and some of these have been around for a while, but certainly the idea of being able through these resins and through using backings to create these incredibly thin, lightweight uh, panels of stone through aluminum honeycomb and, uh, and then fabricate them uh, into l very large panels. And um, th uh, if you've not seen them before, this is one version of it. It's a, an extruded aluminum honeycomb that is resin bonded to the back of uh, Five, five to ten millimeter stone, so so fairly, fairly thin. Uh, in in Europe, they're bonding it to the back of glass when you're using the onyxes as a as a way to get that strength with the the translucent quality of of the onyx. And we thought we'd take you through uh, again a case study of a, and just show you the way this works. But but I think what becomes very obvious in these systems is that. Uh, Unlike dimensional stone where you're using just that, that one piece uh, and in a fairly traditional way, the complexities now have just multiplied hugely because the, these panels have their own um, uh, challenges to using them, but you're also really making them as part of an assembly in terms of suspension and uh, an envelope, and it's also a different trade. So where. Uh, stone was traditionally done by stonemasons. Carpenters can do this, where stone would, you get 200 square feet, get laid up in a day, you'll get 2,000 square feet of panel assemblies put up in a day. And um, this is an example of uh, a Drexel University that our office did in Philadelphia in um, about six, seven years ago in an Indiana limestone. Uh, and, and our interest here was using the stone in a way that was commensurate with the, the uh, thin panel assembly. So we were really interested in using it in a big, big format. And you can see just from the, the fellow in the background there the scale of, of some of these pieces. It looks like a massive, massive piece of stone. It's, uh, uh, there was only one seam uh, between the two floor, the, between the floors, so they're about seven, eight feet, seven feet high, 14 foot floor to floor, and about five feet wide, so, so big pieces. Um, but the challenges of suspending this and figuring it out is, is fairly complicated and new. And this is the back of that panel. You can see there's, uh, in this case, uh, a clip system installed. Every, typically, Mike, what, about every two feet? It would uh, depend on the thickness of the aluminum core that can vary and, and the material. I mean, the, typically, your stone material is acting like a wallpaper. It's not adding much to the strength. The strength is all being picked up by the honeycomb backup. So you can vary the thickness of that. It can come anywhere from quarter inch to two inch thick uh, honeycomb backing if, you'd, if, if you need. Um, 
some of the cautions about these materials. I mean, it's great. We're, we're utilizing them. There's huge benefits. Uh, it's allowing architects to get more creative, um, better use of stone. The cautions are the technical aspects and the installation um, are could be challenging. Uh, you've got multiple connections that you have to ensure engage, which means the, insta the installer has to be very accurate in his layouts and setting out of the, uh, the backup structure. And we have seen cases of failures where some of the anchors are not engaging properly. So, a, a, you know, a quality control program on site with these highly technical systems is very important because it's only as good as how, how it's installed at the end of the day. So. Um, some of the other challenges, I mean, when th there's great products out there and there's products that are manufactured substandard. So, again, there's some failures with delamination with some substandard products. Um, so knowing your fabricator, knowing your supplier, knowing um, their history, their ability to, to provide these type of products. Um, some of the other things you have to be cautious of is, you know, where is it being installed? What's the temperature? What's the climate? These things have limitations. The aluminum honeycomb core is going to have different uh, thermal properties than the stone. So the stone and the backup could move differentially going through temperature changes that could cause problems. So having compatible materials, understanding your, uh, your environmental requirements of where the project's being done, um, these are all some of the technical aspects that need to be considered when you're, when you're using these type of, uh, of materials. And, and I would say that um, it's not all bad. I mean, these are great products, and they're actually in many ways a lot stronger than, than stone. Um, Glenn and I were talking about a particular uh, supplier that, that deals in showmanship quite a lot just before we came in here, and they have a, a fantastic video of... Uh, a honeycomb panel spanning a, about eight feet long between two, uh, two concrete blocks with a sumo wrestler on top of it bouncing up and down like a trampoline. Um, so they are, they, in terms of ASTM or, or uh, European standards, they have incredible flexural strength and there's, they've been tested. They're great products, but the, uh, the challenges of installing them, as, as Mike points out, are quite huge. And you can see in this slide uh, some of this going up. This was a rain screen system, so the joints are all dry. Uh, they were open joints in this case, except at the very grade where we had gasketed it. Um, and you can see that there's a, a really a system of girts and cleats and, and anchors that, that form part of this. And this all needs to be engineered by Mike and, and his team to make sure that, that it works pretty effectively. Uh, you can see it going up, turning the corners, and you can get kind of really great sense of depth with this material. The corners are mitered and glued, in fact, but you never see it from a, a foot or two away, really. Uh, so it, it gives you a, a lot of flexibility, and, and it goes up very, very fast. And, and that's the, the building when it was finished, um, clad in, in this Indiana limestone, which has uh, you know, incredible consistency to it. Uh, a similar product project um, here in Toronto, a residential product, but this was a different system. And I, I point it out only because um, this was also on the surface appeared to be very much uh, similar as an aluminum honeycomb system, but instead of the cleats at the back being, being fastened with, with anchors, there was actually uh, an aluminum sheet on the back, uh, which uh, the, the things were, the cleats were, were fastened to with rivets. And the, the challenge was, and here you can see it, uh, again, we were using unusual sizes that would be a challenge in, in uh, dimensional stone because they were narrow and very, very long, so really subject to, to breakage in, in a conventional um, circumstance. But the challenge uh, environmentally that, that um, Mike pointed out was that the aluminum, um, the, the aluminum backing actually had a different uh, thermal expansion rate than the stone, and so it was subject to a kind of, uh, 
in extremes of temperature when the facade heated up, it was getting subject to a bit of uh, bending movement. And so unlike the project in Philadelphia where the anchoring system was every two feet or so, in this case we ended up, and you can just see it in the background, uh, we ended up with a continuous cleat system that locked the whole, um, the, the whole piece of stone in place so that it didn't um, really move. And, and this is uh, the finished product um, where both uh, dimensional stone in terms of the landscaping and, and some components uh, lower grade were, were solid and thick material. And then this light aluminum honeycomb that was put up. So again, a residential project was put up by uh, uh, kind of residential trades here in the, in the city. Um, more complicated project is one Mike will talk about uh, at, at the UN, I believe. Yeah, this is a project that we are very proud of. Uh, our team worked on this at the uh, United Nations uh, in New York. And um, very complicated geometry you can see, and we worked very closely with the architects and the, uh, the structural people doing the, the backup system. Um, the sequence of the installation was very critical. So we actually, our drawings were built like a puzzle, piece by piece, telling the installer the sequence of the installation. Uh, one from a deflection perspective to keep the, uh, the, the structure balanced, and secondly to access all the connections because there was uh, a, quite a complex uh, series of connections there. Um, one of the other projects that uh, we worked on, the um, Canadian Museum of Human Rights, again, we were involved with the design assist here. The architect had a vision of using alabaster and uh, back, backlighting it um, and not having any shadows on it. So part of the process was coming up with a system of anchors that could allow the light to diffuse around them without seeing shadows on them. So. There were several samples done, several mock-ups, different lightings were tested. Um, one of the other things that was really interesting with the alabaster, because again, like uh, Glenn and Martin mentioned, we, we went to the quarry and we visited the quarry. Alabaster's quarried very similar to the Piazzantina. It comes in various size boulders. And um, the architect, understanding the limits of the available raw material, uh, we did change the jointing pattern to accommodate the material that we had in order to get a better yield out of the raw material. So um, rather than having a typical panel size, uh, the architect was, went with three different widths and three different heights and created a random pattern of this alabaster. Um, the other interesting thing was we did mock-ups with backlighting and the panels that were the lightest in color were actually the least translucent. So the darker materials, when you looked at the alabaster, the darker grays were actually very white when you backlit them, and the really white alabaster was very dark when you backlit it. The light didn't diffuse through it as well. So part of the quality control program that was set up at the quarry was actually having some light panels, and all the panels were put in front of the light, and we had a range that the architect would accept, and that was part of the process in the quality control. So the, um, the connection system, the lighting, again, all this design assist that added to the benefits of the finished product at the end of the day that was all done up front way before the project was needed rather than dealing with all these issues potentially on the job site when you got no time to deal with it. Um, the, uh, there's another shot of the... Uh, the United Nations Memorial, uh, we've got also some shots here of you can see how the sequence of the panels were going in. They weren't necessarily going from top to bottom. They were, we were bouncing around from side to side um, in order to have the, uh, the installer have access to all the connections. Here again is just another view of some of the connections and, and the sequence of going in. It was a very interesting project. It was in the winter, so it was all tarped in. Um, had a hard deadline because the United Nations was meeting and they had an inaugura inauguration and an opening. So there, I mean, they, they were working at what, some points 24 seven to get it done. Uh, they had several shifts going. But at the end of the day, it was, it was a very successful project. And again, speaks to the planning and the collaboration and being able to uh, to
create a very successful project with that process in place. I think just uh, to finish up, we we uh, I know there's a a session specifically related to um, uh, large format panels, so I'm sure you'll hear lots more about them in that. Uh, just finishing up with uh, showing some of the the really amazing innovations uh, be beyond what we showed you from the material basis, but how do you take those materials then and start to execute um, projects or installations or exhibitions with them? And uh, here, Mike, a uh, project you're familiar with? Yeah. This is uh, just a project that I, you know, doing my research and, and looking into different stones and innovations, I'm always uh, researching. This is actually a, a, an arch that's anchored in at the base, but it's completely dry laid, no pins, no anchors. Those stones are all just keyed into each other and forms a structural arch just by the dead load of the stone and the way they're keyed into each other. So again, uh, you know, as architects and designers, I mean, with the advent of BIM technology now, I mean, there, you can get so creative and um, we, we embrace the challenge of trying to make those things work. So uh, from an innovation perspective, I say continue to push the limits and let's uh, get creative, use the new technologies available to us, um, you know, the resins, the honeycomb backing, all these things that we can utilize now um, to do more things with stone and get more creative. Uh, and as engineers, like I said, we, we embrace that and we, we, uh, we love the challenge to make these things work. Uh, again, just some you know, pretty unusual sort of applications. This is a, a half-inch thick stone bench that's backed with uh, carbon fiber coming out of the uh, auto racing industry. Uh, incredible, you know, one sort of incredibly uh, sinuous, voluptuous sort of uh, use of stone in a pretty unconventional way, but because of the use of the, the marriage of these two materials was able to happen. and. I saw a fairly large person sitting on this uh, successfully, I would, I would have to say. Um, again, using um, resins uh, to, to really mix resins and colored resins in this, play, in, in this case to, to make a bench. Uh, these are some of the, the pieces um, Mike's working on, I think, from the Apple Store. Uh, this looks like the Apple Store the Apple headquarters, so they, their store in London has a very similar kind of detailing about, again, using CNC machines and five-axis routers to, to do these kinds of um, uh, curved and curvilinear forms. Uh, you can see people are really pushing the limits with uh, using machines to, again, going directly from uh, um, uh, drawings or 3D models into uh, execution on projects like like this and I think we're not very far away from seeing 3D printing for uh, for stone uh, project from uh, really this is a, a mock-up of something that uh, Calatrava did for the World Trade Center and then um, I thought we'd just end with uh, a couple of quick notes on sustainability and wellness. I know, again, there's other sessions that are going to be focused on, on the LEED program uh, specifically. But we started by saying stone's a natural material. And, and one of the kind of remarkable things about stone when you think of it as a cradle-to-grave kind of application is that there's virtually no wastage from the fabrication of stone. So when you're at the quarries, you actually see this kind of food chain of, uh, of blocks being cut and blocks turning into slabs and the offcuts of that turning into uh, aggregates and, and those aggregates eventually getting uh, ground down into powders that gets used in the cosmetic industry and the pharmaceutical industry as binders and color, coloring agents. And so really, uh, stone from the very beginning has... Um, uh, really no wastage to it. And when you start to look at some of the life cycle uh, reports done, and uh, curiously enough, University of, I think it's Tennessee, about five or six years ago, did some quite remarkable research on trying to figure out the embodied energy and the cost of, of producing granite and limestones and indexing them against other products to 
really uh, have the stone industry have this kind of knowledge base about the, um, the impact on the environment of uh, fabricating and producing that. And then um, certainly, certainly the maintenance issues, the life cycle issues. Um, Bill started by saying I'm, I'm currently working in Ottawa on the uh, uh, temporary home for the Senate. This is a building that was built 100 years ago where we're actually recovering the stone and reusing it, uh, taking old stone off the building and out of the floors and reusing it as a, a kind of new terrazzo pattern. There's, there's probably nothing more environmental or, or low energy than being able to reuse a building. And stone buildings are, I think, remarkably uh, um, able and, and uh, adaptable for that kind of, of reuse. Uh, lack of VOCs certainly in, in terms of its thermal mass, uh, a lot of architects are using stone now as heat sinks. And then finally, uh, something that I know both Glenn and, um, and Mike have, have brought to my attention as well is the really emergence of, of something like the well, well Building Organization and standards that are looking at uh, human environment uh, or the impact of buildings on human environment. Yeah, it's uh, well is um, basically continuing where lead ended. So the people that quarterback lead have now gone to well. And what it is, it's a measurable, uh, measurable standards for health and wellness. So it's how does a building impact us? So we spend 90% of our times indoor. Well has now developed standards on how we measure those impacts. So the amount of light that we use, the, the kind of paint colors that we use, the kind of finishes that we use. Uh, Wells very interested in measuring the impacts of stone, which have been documented uh, since the time of the Romans. Uh, so we're gonna be seeing well buildings coming onto line with, with lead buildings. And uh, the stone industry is embracing that. I think that's it. Uh, that was just a kind of quick overview of some of the things that are happening that we've been experiencing uh, together. I really just again um, I want to encourage you to look at uh, collaboration with uh, suppliers and engineers because this is really I think what is opening up the opportunity to use these in a way that's going to be really successful. So thanks all for coming out this early. got some questions please make your way to the uh, to the microphone we can pose them to the uh, to the panel here how do you envision that occurring i know i'm familiar with like 3d printed metals particularly when it comes to like sculpture and uh, more durability for buildings itself for 3d printed buildings how would that translate into say uh, are you referring to like synthetic stone being 3d printed and having that strength that could actually uh, like maybe graphene or some other nano component being put into this liquid matrix that would... Well, I, I, to be honest, I was thinking of it more in terms of um, the ability of, of a lot of these technologies to migrate down to smaller scale kinds of uh, crafts, people, and, and fabricators. So um, the stone industry traditionally, I think, has been... Uh, a big tool industry. Um, you know, it's, it's giant gang saws and giant fabrication plants and polishing plants. And, uh, and you would have said the same about metal 10 years ago. Uh, it, it wasn't something that uh, you, you'd have seen otherwise. And yet now we're seeing 3D printing for, for metal in, in some cases. So I, I think it's that and the ability of some of the uh, the carving machines and all of those things to kind of, they continue to reduce in price and okay. the software continues to uh, get more sophisticated. And as those things come together, I think it's going to bring opportunities to do uh, um, a kind of uh, type of work that we're not seeing yet, really. Thank you. My question is about the dura durability of new uh, systems and innovation. So stone is, uh, for me, linked with the long-term, really, uh, century maybe, buildings and products. And now when you innovate, which is great, but then you have this 
thing that you don't know how long it's going to last and the feeling that maybe it's not lasting so long. So how do you see these new technologies in terms of maybe 10, 20, 30 years from now? Anyone? Well, I, I think that um, <coughs> my sense is a lot of these have been around for certainly that long, and I, I would hope that when we're talking about buildings and building envelopes, hopefully we're talking about more than 10 or 20 years or we've got a bigger problem. Um, the, the degradation of stone, uh, and there's been lots of uh, environmental studies on the environmental impacts of acid rain and, and uh, the, the kind of degradation of stone face is, is really a very long, long process in many cases. And so the, um, in the case of something like the limestone building in Philadelphia, uh, we're really not too concerned because the amount of surface wear is really the issue. Uh, the, the systems that are holding it up, again, it's a rain screen system. It, it uses galvanized or stainless steel connections, which have been um, really, uh, I think, used in the industry for probably the last 20 years. It's, we're finding the problems when you get into restoration, and I'm sure, Mike, you're facing this as well. It's, it's systems that have been installed maybe 30 years or more where the metal components are rusting. And, um, and so the challenge isn't necessarily for the stone, but it's for the rust jacking and the, the impact it's having on stone facades. Uh, I think in a way the technology is getting better and is um, mitigating against some of the challenges that, that uh, we're facing and in going into other buildings. Again, in the project in Ottawa, which was uh, had anchors, it was built in the turn of the century, we're now having to go in and try to repair rusted anchors and things that because they were just used with general carbon steel and the damage to the stone, both with staining and and spalling is really the, the most significant factor, and that's with stone that's four or five inches thick. Um, if I could just put my engineering hat on to, to some of the new technologies, um, there needs to be some caution for sure, and ensuring that we're vetting out and testing the materials properly. Um, I mean, I, I've seen failures with buildings two or three years old where they've had to be reclad because the proper energy and input wasn't done properly. At the same point, I've seen there are buildings with some of these technologies that are 20 years old that are still performing well. So the caution is understanding the material that you're using from a stone perspective and understanding the backups and the limitations, the anchoring system that you're attaching with. So if they're executed properly, I believe we can have buildings that can last quite a long time. But with the new technologies and the resins and the epoxies and the different types of honeycomb backups and all these variables that could go into that, knowing the material and understanding the material is very critical to the success of the, of the system. Because like I said, I've seen black granite honeycomb back panels because the thermal properties were not considered, you know, all the panels cracked after, the, after two years because of that thermal, not understanding how that's gonna work in a hot environment. Um, so some of, some of the cautions with the new technologies for sure. I mean, when you're talking about a three or four inch thick, traditionally laid up stone, they last a hundred years. And yeah, the anchors rust out, but the stone still performs, even though you may have lost an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch or even half an inch off the face over the hundred year term of the stone. But if you're, deal, if you're starting with 10 millimeters now and you lose 5 millimeters, that's a much more impactful loss of material than when it's on a 4 or 5 inch thick stone. So again, just some of the things to be aware of, knowing the material, knowing uh, the, the technical properties. The attachment system has to allow for movement. I've seen some where the installers go in and again, no knock on the carpenters and people that are coming into the industry they screw the aluminum panels in, all the rail systems, and they screw them all in hard. While aluminum has a pretty big range of thermal expansion and contraction, one anchor needs to be locked, the other ones have to allow for a little bit of slip movement. So from a technical perspective, all these things are great, but they need to be executed properly. And if they are, 
I see no reason why we can't have good longevity to a lot of these new technologies that are, that are coming in the market. Actually, I got to disagree with Mike. A carpenter should never install stone, okay? The stone guy does the stone. Uh, we're learning all the time. Uh, the, the advent of, um, of uh, phenomenon, and tell me if I'm pronouncing this correctly, hysteresis, is uh, the expansion of stone that has, uh, and Mike will speak more technically about it, but evidence of this was First Canadian Place. Now, First Canadian Place stone was tested 500, 1,000 freeze-thaw cycles. It, it was tested to the upteenth, and through engineers and architects, everybody made the best um, technical assumptions to carry it forward. Well, 30, 30 years later, uh, you can never recreate the amount of freeze-thaw cycles that the stone went through, and because of all different materials constantly coming up, we're constantly learning, and this phenomenon was discovered. Maybe if you want to elaborate yeah, a bit it, on that. I mean, that's part of, part of the advent of new technology was the, uh, the advent of the gang saws and being able to slab material at thinner. And that was the introduction of the thin slab material was around that time. The Amico building in Chicago was another example of the same thing. Certain materials, typically the white marbles, only some of them, not all of them, experience this phenomenon of as it goes through thermal cycles and freeze thaw and moisture, the panels eventually start bowing over time. And some of them, I mean, I've seen examples of buildings on four foot high panels where the panels are bowed out three inches in the middle. And it looks like it was designed that way as a pillow effect. But eventually they, they build up enough stress and they crack. So this was something that was a new technology at the time that nobody really knew it. It, it, it manifested itself over a 20, 15, 20, 30 year period. So I mean with some new technologies and new advents, I mean even from an engineering perspective, you try and vet everything out, there may be a possibility that you could experience something like that down the road. Um, but uh, again, knowing the materials, specking the right materials, being cautious with a lot of the, I mean, the resins, a lot of these exotic stones with the resins, I mean, I see some people specking them on exterior of buildings. Well, you have to be very cautious. Martin said there's, they can get laminated on glass and used effectively that way. They can potentially be used on honeycomb backing. Um, so there's ways to use all these new materials that are out there, and there's you know, limitations and advantages to where they can be used and where they shouldn't be used. Um, you know, bringing the right people together and asking all the right questions at the beginning to make sure um, you're on the right track with all those, uh, those technical aspects are very important. And that's where collaboration with fabricators, installers, quarries, all those people getting them involved and getting the right input, right information from all the stakeholders is very important. I've got a question here for Glenn. Glenn, what's, uh, what's affecting you now that wasn't affecting you in terms of what you have to do 20 years ago? It's, it's definitely the, the amount of information that we have to deal with and the variables. The, the fact that there's this over 500 marketable stones and trying to marry those up with the proper setting system is probably our biggest challenge. Um, using products that have never been used for, for certain applications that's, that's probably our, our biggest challenge right now. Okay, terrific. I got a question for Mike. Um, you know, cladding systems are becoming more and more popular. You know, demands are getting for, for bigger, lighter materials. What challenges are you finding to engineer those types of systems? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I spoke to some of them. You yeah. know, the larger panels, the, the quality control aspects of them. Um, I think one of the things that's being missed a lot on some of these projects is, uh, is the inspections on the job site and making sure that uh, specifications are being followed. Um, so that's an import a very important aspect of, of some of these highly technical engineered systems need to be executed properly. Um, but again, there's no reason why they can't be done and they're very successful. and. You know, as you know, architects should embrace all these new technologies, and you know, BIM has allowed uh, architects to get a lot more creative. So that's um, 
those are, you know, they introduce new challenges, but we welcome them. Oh, I love it. I love it. What, as an industry, uh, I guess myself as a supplier, uh, also, like I said, we're, we're members of the TTMAC, what, what do we need to do better in terms of education for the architect and the fabricator and, I guess, the, the owners and designers to uh, get them to better understand stone? Anybody want to weigh in on that? Um, basically, we, uh, the information's there. People have to seek it out. I think uh, TT Mac could maybe go a little bit more web-based uh, and a little friendlier, uh, making it much easier for people to obtain the information that, that they need. Um, reach out, ask questions, as, as Mike said. That's, that's the goal. And Bill, I think we have a few questions sitting on the floor. Morning. My apologies, I came in late, so I don't know all what, what has been covered. I only came in the last five minutes. I have a maintenance-related question. I'm dealing with some granite situations, uh, 20, 30 millimeter flame on the outside. I'm getting a lot of moisture coming up. It looks like the base, or whether some of it probably going through the grouting, that is discoloring the stone. So if anybody has a run into that, have kind of any kind of a solution. But stone is as um, young as late six months ago, we're getting, and Glenn knows my environment, um, a lot of it. Uh, I've seen, uh, I have a couple of locations where it's actually got, got into, into the granite, and, and you're getting like pock marks breaking, breaking on the top. Um, it sounds like moisture is wicking something. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like there, there, there could be either standing water or water at the base of the, of the stone. I mean, I'm assuming it's going down below grade, the stone? No, 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 it's above. Or it's above grade? Mm -hmm. oh, mind you, it's because it's an island where uh, the locations I'm looking at are really uh, half a kilometer from the uh, water's edge kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, not knowing the details, it's, yeah. it's difficult to say, but usually when it's wicking up like that, there would be standing water. I mean, if, if it's in standing water, capillary action, it will suck up into the stone eventually. And it, a lot of stones will be very susceptible to that constant moisture that could cause some spalling on the face uh, mm -hmm. and some, you know, premature deterioration if it's exposed to that much uh, moisture. Any way of treating it? How, how's it? How's it bonded to the wall? Well, this is act, um, these are on the wall. Floor, floor situations. Floor Sorry. situations. Sorry, floor, situ floor situations. So it's, it's, so it's, it's on the floor. floor. Yeah. Okay. Like I've, I've got a new mall just open, and uh, it's about uh, six months. And so we've got a, maybe about 250,000 uh, square feet laid right around as a sidewalk. And the stone, it's uh, an off beige, is, is it's turned black right now. Okay. What I've done, what I've done, um, I've actually redone the grouting uh, with a waterproof grouting mm -hmm. to prevent moisture going in. And then I, I've used the poultice as a sample. Um, it's come off. I would say about 80% has come off, but within a week it's back there. Now the the location, I would say it's about two to three hundred feet of, above sea level. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's going to be a hard one to answer strictly straight out of the the, the, the panel. Um, but yeah, it sounds like there's some moisture issues. There's certainly uh, people here at the show, and you know. Uh, Mike, you can talk to after. I've got another location that's about 3,000 square feet above it's on a mountain. And again, it's, it's a house situation, and that's marble. But I've got the same problem. Yeah. I think maybe if you had some pictures or a little more information that I don't think we can get into right here, right now, might be, might be, uh, might be a little more beneficial. Okay, thanks. I wanted to just continue on that first Canadian place because that was a good example on the failure or something of the sub material. To get into more detail, was the problem with First Canadian Place the fact that it was a softer material that was susceptible to this bowing, the particular marble? Or was it because it was cut too thin, or was it the anchoring system, or a combination of a number of factors? It, it, it's the raw material that experiences that. So, and it's okay. not necessarily, a, a, I mean, it's the crystalline structure of the makeup of the marble that actually right. causes it. Um, you can quarry marble, you know, three kilometers away and not have a problem from the marble on the same mountain range 
but because of the different crystal structure, one is susceptible to it and one is not. Okay. And uh, what's, again, what's the proper term? Is it hysteresis? Hysteresis. Hy hysteresis. Yeah. hysteresis. Hysteresis is the technical term for it. Um, and what happens is that, I mean, the, 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 the crystalline structure starts pushing apart from each other. Okay. Right. And the exposure to the temperature cycles on the one side of the stone right. cause it to eventually bowl and eventually get to a point where it, the stresses are high enough that you either get cracks in the material or it cracks at the anchor location because of the stresses that are developed. Um, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of buildings, uh, Helsinki, uh, there was a big project there. Um, the Amico building in Chicago, right. first Canadian place here. They were all built around the same time. When the new, you know, we went to three centimeter stone from traditional, you know, 100, cent, 100 millimeter, you know, like thicker stone down to the thin stone. Right. So the thick stone would not be susceptible to it because the impact on the, on the outside surface and the cycles because of the thickness was not susceptible to it. As we got thinner and thinner with the technology, then it became an impact on the stone. Okay, but it's some, something that even the experts or the client could have envisioned. Like I was thinking, is this something they were being cheap by doing it thinner, like being stingy on the no, cost? No, because no, I mean, we're using three centimeter stone all over the place now, yeah. uh, highly okay. successful. I okay. mean, even after that, even other materials. So it was a, it was a material specific phenomenon. It's not because of the stone. And, I mean, and they did, the owners, architects, engineers did do their due diligence. All the materialists tested. They did run, I don't know how many hundreds and Prior three, to installation? Abs, ab, exactly. Any large, and Michael attested yeah. this, any large exterior cladding job, you are going to go through testing. You're going to go for your three, freeze thaw. You're going to go for your flexural strength. Uh, if it's in a curtain wall adaptation, you're going full mock-up, uh, in many cases, to destruction. So it's, it's thoroughly okay. tested. But this particular phenomenon is not something that could reasonably be tested, just because now now it can be. Now it can be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, and there's been huge research teams in Europe that have have. Uh, I mean, there's studies now that are probably approaching 15 or 20 years old. Okay. And they're constantly monitoring and testing, and in, in a, a big. I mean, I've got a binder this thick on the research that they're doing on that now. So it, there are tests available now that you can uh, you can understand if the material is susceptible to it or not. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, good morning. Good morning. My question is uh, about uh, engineered stone, in other words, quartz. So we have seen um, a dramatic increase in the market in the, last, in the past five, ten years. My question is, uh, what's your perspective uh, or uh, how the uh, next five, ten years, the market of the uh, quartz going to be. Uh, if there is uh, any new product to pl replace or substitute the quartz, what could it be and why? Okay, can I go ahead? Uh, yeah, engineered quartz. Uh, the technology for engineered materials has been around since the 70s. So the first generation was all marble-based products, which were cast into blocks and then cut. You may still see some buildings done in Toronto. Um, I do not think we've reached the saturation point yet with engineered quartz. Uh, there's over 72 manufacturers, sorry, 82 manufacturers throughout the world. Um, now people are competing for that market space, and we see the advent of porcelain panels, large format porcelain panels pushing into that world. So we have half-inch porcelain panels, three-quarter-inch porcelain panels. Um, they are not going to be at the same price point as engineered quartz has now. They're going to be a little more expensive, depending on the thickness of the panel. Um, uh, the laminate panel, I think, in, is comparable. Some of their colors are comparable to some of the engineered quartz. Um, you're also going to see other manufacturers jumping on board from different parts of the world who have lower production costs for engineered quartz. The question is going to be quality control on those. So to answer your questions, I don't think we've reached saturation yet. I think we're very close. And I think the market is open and ready to embrace substitutes for that product. Okay. Okay. This is uh, primarily for Glenn, but if you guys want to hop in on this as well, that'd be great. 
So as a fabricator, uh, what do you need from diamond tooling and, manuf and machinery manufacturers in order to work with this new technology, these new materials, and meet these changing customer preferences that you're seeing? As a stove manufacturer and not a carpenter, I just yeah. want to reiterate that again. Uh, we need you guys to keep pace with all the new products that are coming out. We need you guys to be testing products as they're coming out. I, we need you guys to be proactive. Go out there, find out what the new stones are, and give me the tools to work with it. Right now, it's, um, it's a reactive situation. Porcelain panels came out. I don't know how many combinations of blades we tried. And finally, we're starting to get blades that are going to cut. Um, CNC tooling for these porcelain panels, CNC tooling for these new limestones, marble quartzites. Quartzites are very, very brittle material, yet soft. So we need you guys to be proactive and give us a solution before we ask for, for it. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much all for, for coming out, and thank you very, very much to our panelists for today.